The small town secrets murder trial remains underway in New Hampshire. Defendant Timothy Verrill is facing a jury accused of killing Gina Pellegrini and Christine Sullivan back in 2017. Prosecutors say that he was a paranoid drug dealer who brutally beat and stabbed the two women before discarding their bodies under the home of Sullivan's boyfriend, Dean Sporunk. But Verrill claims that Sporunk is the real killer. On the stand now is Stephen Johnson, an investigator who reviewed surveillance footage from the crime scene. Let's get you right back inside that courtroom. And the whole truth under the penalties of perjury. I do. Please be seated. Please introduce yourself to the jurors. Uh, my name is Stephen Johnson. And where do you work? Uh, I work at the uh, uh, New Hampshire Attorney General's office. And what is your particular assignment at the Attorney General's office? I'm an investigator in the Criminal Bureau, uh, and I'm assigned to the Narcotics Unit. Uh, about when did you join the Attorney General's office? Um, January of 2017. Were you asked to review surveillance footage as well as video clips and still photos taken from that surveillance footage? I was. Is it fair to say that your knowledge of this case beyond reviewing that surveillance footage is minimal? That's correct. To your knowledge, was anything done to enhance the video clips and the still photos that were taken from the footage that you reviewed and that will be shown shortly? No, not to my knowledge. With respect to the, to the portions of surveillance video footage that you reviewed, is that contained in several digital files in States Exhibit 28, which you reviewed and verified earlier? That's correct. So looking on the screen at the first of many slides that we're going to be viewing during the course of your testimony, what is shown on this particular slide? Those are 15 different uh, hour long or so um, files that uh, contain video. So State's Exhibit 28, I believe, is a flash drive? Correct. So if someone were to load that flash drive into a computer, this would be what would show up on the computer? That's correct. So what is indicated by each one of the 15 rows, the first of which is highlighted in yellow at the top? It's just uh, a file that contains about an hour's worth of video uh, from six different cameras. And uh, we have 15 separate video files here, and all that's contained in State's Exhibit 28? Correct. With respect to the data file names for each of these 15 video files, the first one ends 120CA. Did you label those data files, or was that how they were labeled when you viewed these video files? That was how they were labeled when I viewed them. So each one of these 15 video files, for how long of a time period of surveillance footage do most of these 15 files contain? Approximately an hour. The reviewed surveillance video footage from which clips and still photos were taken that we're going to be viewing shortly and continuing to do, view tomorrow, were those images taken from the video files that we're looking at here? That's correct. <clears throat> Did the video clips and the still photos that we're going to be reviewing come from one single surveillance camera or from multiple separate cameras? Separate cameras, multiple ones. For each one of these separate 15 data files, when somebody opens up a file, does surveillance footage come up for a single camera or for multiple cameras? Comes up for multiple cameras. So let's continue with this first highlighted file for an example. Again, it's ending 120 CA. When the data file is open, does the following screen ultimately come up on the video player? That's correct. So how many separate surveillance cameras are there footage for for this particular data file? There are six. And is that the same for each one of the 15 data files? Does each one of those 15 files contain footage from six separate cameras? They're all except for one. So 14 of the 15 have these six cameras. One has five of these cameras? That's correct. The six cameras from which footage is seen here, are those all the cameras from which footage is seen on these data files? In other words, there's no more than these six cameras in vantage points? That's correct. It's just these six. And the next slide is going to be of those six cameras and vantage points. From your review of the surveillance video, do any of the six 
surveillance cameras pan around or does each camera show a set location? It just shows a set location, each camera. Was there any audio that accompanied the surveillance video? No audio. Have you compared the surveillance video footage and still photos taken from the footage from these six vantage points with photos of the exterior and interior of a residence in order to determine the approximate locations and fields of view for these six surveillance cameras? Yes, I have. Turning to the next slide, are those approximate six surveillance camera locations and fields of view represented in this photograph, which is States Exhibit 33? Yes, it is. So we have cameras. They begin with one, two, three, where we don't have a four, and then we have a five, a six, and a seven. Why are they labeled one through three and five, six, seven without a four? That's the way the cameras were set up in the system, apparently. Uh, we see some white V shapes that I'm indicating with the laser pointer, as well as white arrows. What do these white areas indicate? Well, in the ones that have the V shape, uh, it really shows you the view that uh, the camera shows uh, of each uh, location. Um, and then the in arrows the are indicated the uh, direction that the cameras are pointing on the interior side. So six and seven are interior cameras. One, five, two, and three are all exterior cameras. So camera one, labeled yellow, that I'm indicating with the laser pointer, looks generally towards where? What part of the house? Looks towards the uh, driveway area. Camera number two, labeled in purple, looks generally towards where? It also looks towards the camera of uh, the uh, driveway area, but covers a part of the uh, driveway that uh, camera one misses, which is blocked by the house itself. And actually, if we can go back to camera one, uh, if we go off to the left here, what's off to the left? Uh, the uh, Meterboro Road, the uh, town road that the uh, residence is in. Next is uh, camera label number three in red. Generally, where does look that look towards? Excuse me? Uh, camera number three labeled in red. Yep. Generally, where does that look towards? That looks towards the um, back of the area of the house, but also has a good view of the uh, entrance area um, uh, that most residents use to, to gain access and, and egress from the home. And actually in this overhead photo, we see two uh, large outbuildings. There's one to the left that I'm indicating with the laser pointer. And one He's laying the foundation for some of the best evidence we know is video camera footage. He's describing where the camera has looked. And we will get you back inside that hearing right after a very short break. Stay tuned, Court TV Live. Drug ring, a double murder, and deadly secrets in a small town. Prosecutors allege Timothy Barrow killed two women because he believed they were working as police informants. The Small Town Secrets Murder Trial, today on Court TV. There's no way, Lauren, I can ever come up with this. We're moving closer to the trial in the case against Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Welcome back to Court TV Live. Before we get you back to New Hampshire, let's quickly turn to Ohio, where a trial date has now been set for Lisa Nacrelli. She's the woman accused of trying to lure a four-year-old boy away from his parents while impersonating a child protective services worker. Nacrelli told police she'd been drinking and happened to come upon the boy who she thought was not being supervised. She was later arrested and hit with several charges, including attempted abduction. The defendant originally opted for a bench trial, but her attorneys retracted that re request rather today during a hearing held this morning. Judge, are you setting that April date for a jury trial? Correct. Okay. You want bench trial or jury trial? Jury trial, Judge. We, we intended to waive or retract the former waiver that was submitted by prior counsel and set it for a jury. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. We'll set this for a jury trial on April 29th and a final pretrial conference April 11th. 
All right, let's turn now back to New Hampshire, where Timothy Verrill stands accused of stabbing to death Jenna Pellegrini and Christine Sullivan. This happened in 2017. Right now, the jury is hearing from Stephen Johnson, an investigator who reviewed surveillance footage from the crime scene, talking about all the different cameras and which directions they were pointing. Let's go back in. Building to the left, and what's the large outbuilding to the right? The um, large building to the left is the main residence to the property, and the right one that you have the uh, uh, pointer on currently is uh, for a barn garage type structure with uh, two bays. And we noted before there is no camera four labeled on the video footage, right? That's correct. Uh, camera five labeled in orange. Uh, where is its approximate location? It's on the ground floor. It looks out onto a, uh, uh, a doorway that, that comes out from the, that ground floor, also up a staircase that goes up into the um, deck area of the home. And the four cameras that we just reviewed, they're all outside cameras? Camera one, camera five, camera two, and camera th three are all exterior outside uh, and the last two video surveillance cameras, cameras six and seven, labeled blue and green, do those cameras show the inside of the residence rather than outside areas of that house? That's correct. Uh, prior to trial, did you review a number of still photographs, states labeled uh, states exhibits 30A through 30Z, taken from surveillance video files that were given to you to, uh, for review? Yes. So turning to the surveillance videos that we're, we will be playing, let's go back to what's depicted on the videos generally when a digital file storing those videos is opened on a computer. So on the screen is State's Exhibit 30A. And what does this exhibit depict generally? Generally depicts the views during daylight hours um, of the uh, exterior uh, cameras as well as the uh, two interior cameras. And the numbers on the top left-hand corner of each surveillance still, I'm indicating the uh, one in yellow here. What do those numbers indicate? Indicam it indicates the camera and the location that uh, the uh, camera uh, is showing in the view for the, uh, in the system. And each of the six different colors that we see here, we see yellow, purple, red, orange, blue, and green. Going back to that overhead, do those colors correlate to the colors seen on that overhead photo? Yes, they do. So sticking with the one in yellow, the top left-hand corner, is that the same camera colored yellow in the overhead photo that's indicated by the yellow arrow down here? It is. Now, are all the surveillance videos date stamped and time stamped? Yes, they are. And is that date and timestamp highlighted in pink for exterior surveillance camera one on the upper left-hand corner? It is. And let's take a closer look at that surveillance camera as an example in the next slide. Is the date and timestamp at the bottom center of this still photo, is that enlarged here? It is. Is the date and timestamp embedded on the surveillance video? In other words, it remains on the screen when the video footage is played on the player? That's correct. Do you know whether the dates and times as indicated on the video are accurate? I do not. With respect to the time, in this example, the time is indicated as 1,618 seconds. Is that military time? That's correct. And I expect that most jurors know what military time means, but if you can explain it to those who may not. Well, military time works on a 24-hour clock, um, beginning with midnight. Um, so 1 a.m. would be 0, 100 hours. Uh, continues all the way through the, tw the till noontime, uh, at which point, once you hit noontime, now you're going to go into uh, um, where it changes significantly for the average person. So by 1 p.m., it's now 1,300 hours. So in this particular document, 
um, that has, is before you, 1,600 hours is at 4 p.m. Turning to the next slide. From observing portions of the surveillance video, are you familiar with the camera location? Still with us, Coria Pegues and Marie Pereira. Let me get your last thoughts about this case. Let me start with you, Marie, as we're talking about the surveillance <coughs> video. Tell me your thoughts about this case and the uh, retrial of Timothy Verrill. I'm not saying that this testimony is not relevant, but I'm still caught up with the opening statements, which basically are roadmaps by the prosecutor and defense attorney to give us a GPS of whether we should go to Conviction Street or Reasonable Doubt Road. And to me, I'm still leaning towards Reasonable Doubt Road until they show me who is the blood of that person that was on the ceiling, whose DNA was under the nail of the victim. This is why all of this testimony, I'm not saying that is irrelevant, but I'm still stuck on that. That creates a reasonable doubt. And in my mind, <clears throat> I need to know whose DNA was that, period. So they need to work on that when I say they prosecution, because I'm still stuck on reasonable doubt road. All right. And we know that they're drug users, drug sellers and all involved in this. And we know the defense is saying it was the homeowner who committed this crime. Your last thoughts. I'm on the same block as Marie, reasonable doubt road <laughs> right now. So we'll see, but I can't wait to see the testimony from the kingpin, Dan, Yes. I'm waiting for him to get up on that stand. I completely agree with you, Corey, and I think that's gonna be pivotal testimony for this jury to consider to decide what they think happened. All right, thank you, Corey Pegues, for being here, especially on set here in studio with us. Marie Pereira, we know, will be sticking around. Michael Ayala, of course, joining me next. We will bring you more testimony in the Small Town Secrets murder trial for Timothy Verrill. Stay with us here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcox. And I'm Michael Ayala. We're both here today giving you your front row seat to justice. We are in New Hampshire this afternoon where defendant Timothy Verrill is standing trial for a second time for the 2017 murders of Christine Sullivan and Jenna Pellegrini. Prosecutors claim Verrill stabbed the two women after becoming paranoid that one of them was an informant with the police. But the defense says Sullivan's boyfriend, who owned the home where the women's body bodies were found, is the real killer. All right, let's get you back into court now, where an investigator is testifying direct examination about surveillance footage of that home. So let's begin with the top row. Exterior cameras one, two, and three. And they're highlighted in white here. Are there locations relative to one another and a driveway depicted in this next slide? Yes, they are. And if you can explain the relative locations of those three exterior camera, camera viewpoints using this blue arrow as a point of reference for each surveillance camera. The camera um, one in yellow um, shows the uh, Meterboro Road entrance to the driveway. And am I pointing to the entrance, Meterboro Road, to the driveway with the laser pointer? That's correct. So this is the driveway? That's correct. Okay. And as a vehicle goes in the direction of this blue arrow, turning to exterior camera two, where would it show up? It would show up uh, in the middle of that driveway area, but behind uh, the uh, house, so it would be go out of view of camera one. Okay, so the vehicle goes this way, and would it come up towards us in camera two? That's correct. And lastly, exterior camera three. Camera three shows that small parking area that is directly behind the home um, and that part of the driveway that is um, lost in both camera one and two. So if a vehicle were to come from Meterboro Road up the driveway all the way to the house, going to across the top, it would go in this direction, this direction, and then this direction? That's correct. Next, as to relative locations, let's turn to exterior camera three in red and exterior camera six 
in, I'm sorry, blue, right here. If you it can explain the location relationship between the yellow arrow for exterior camera three and the yellow circled area for interior camera six. Well, the arrow, uh, the yellow arrow on the exterior camera three shot points to a trellis area uh, that's in a light colored, um, and that's approximately the area where the, the doorway is to the uh, uh, residents. And that doorway is uh, circled in yellow on the uh, picture from interior camera six. And it's probably hard to discern a, a door in this particular still, but in videos that we'll be viewing, would it be obvious that it's a doorway? That's correct. Uh, please explain the location relationship uh, of the two interior surveillance cameras, which are interior camera six in blue and interior camera seven in green. And let's go to the next slide for that. So we have interior camera six at the top and interior camera seven at the bottom. That's correct. Um, interior camera six looks towards the doorway of the entrance to the residence on the ground floor. It's the one that is used primarily by residents to come in and, and leave the property. It opens into a um, utility laundry room area. And then as you walk through that utility laundry room area and follow the yellow line, uh, yellow arrow, uh, it leads you directly into a den room or interior den room uh, that's covered by camera seven. So if one were to walk through this door, walk in this direction of the arrow, uh, be lost in sight here, but then reappear here? Immediately. So those two interior areas are right next to each other? That's correct. And finally, let's discuss the location for the sixth surveillance camera labeled number five in orange on the bottom left here. And is this another exterior camera? It is. It shows that doorway, which is uh, to the far right of the viewing, and then also to the staircase that leads up to the second uh, floor decking area, and then out to the backyard portion. Is this particular area of the house that we're viewing here in the vantage point for any of the other five surveillance cameras that we've reviewed? Just a small portion of the backyard might be covered in camera three, but most of this is not covered by any other camera. So at this time, we're going to begin reviewing surveillance footage for these six cameras at various embedded times and dates. And for a roadmap for the jurors, we're going to be reviewing about 200 slides and about 40 video clips. That'd be correct. So we're going to be doing that the entirety of the rest of this afternoon and continuing well into tomorrow, correct? That's correct. The various clips that we're going to be playing, are they contained on State's Exhibit 96, which you've reviewed before as well? Yes. So we're going to begin with the video in the digital file ending 120 CA. It has a beginning and ending embedded time and date of between 3 and 4 a.m. on January 25th of 2017. Now first, to orientate the jurors, for each of the digital files that we're going to be reviewing, uh, will we start with basically the same uh, overhead photograph? Yes, we will. And is the hour-long period embedded in the video to be shown highlighted, oops, sorry, <coughs> highlighted at the bottom of this slide right here? They are. For this hour-long digital file, there are three surveillance cameras that have been highlighted in the overhead photo. Exterior cameras two and three, and interior camera six. Are we going to be playing video or showing still photographs from these cameras for this hour-long time period? Yes, we will. And are we going to follow a similar pattern with all the other video files that we're going to be watching today and into tomorrow? That would be correct. With respect to the four times for those three cameras that are indicated on the right here, what do those four times 
represent. And it re represents the time of the video that we're going to be looking at. So for this particular hour-long video file, we're going to be playing two portions of surveillance video from interior camera six and one portion of a surveillance video each from exterior camera two and exterior camera three? That's correct. At the beginning of the time period for this particular video file, are vehicles seen on surveillance cameras parked outside the residence already? Yes, there are. And how many vehicles are parked outside the residence? Two. And are still photos of those two parked vehicles depicted on the slide that we're showing now, States Exhibit 30B? Yes, they are. And so we have one vehicle here and one vehicle here. They're both circled in yellow? Correct. Does this slide also show the locations of the surveillance cameras from which these two still photos were taken? They do. So with respect to this still photo, it's taken from what camera? Camera three. And for this photo, it's taken from what camera? Camera two. In the portions of video that you reviewed for this time period, how many people are seen? Three. And can you make out the gender for those three people? Yes. And what are the genders? Uh, two males and a female. The first two video clips that we're going to be playing from interior camera six, highlighted in blue, do the clips show that one woman and two men seen on surveillance video during this period? Yes, it does. So let's start with the two video clips from interior camera six. Again, it's highlighted in blue. Is a still photo from that camera here on the bottom right? Yes. And again, the lighted area to the left highlighted in yellow. Where again generally does this area lead to? That is uh, the exterior door in, or entrance door that uh, is usually used for egress to the, to the property. So we'd be going to the outside from uh, the and entire, the inside of that room. And what about again the doorway to the right here indicated by the red arrow? Where again does that lead to generally? That would be a den area that's in the middle of the property, and uh, that's covered by camera seven. So with that context, let's play the two camera six. Video. And we are just about to get into some of the playing of the video from mm -hmm. those surveillance cameras. And Michael, this is, to me, not only showing you who was there, what was there, but also it can be argued what didn't happen. Yeah, and you know what? This is really strong evidence for the state. It's important evidence for the state when you talk about the fact that there are issues with the forensics. Yes. So this is going to be important stuff. Absolutely. All right, we're going to pause it there. When we come back, we'll get you back in to watch these videos together. Tonight on Closing Arguments, the mystery of Madeline Soto. The Florida teenager was found dead in the woods, and now her mother's boyfriend is the prime suspect. Court TV teams breaking down all angles of this investigation as this community searches for answers. Plus, reaction to today's big hearing in the murder case against Karen Reed will bring you the latest as the killer or cover-up trial moves closer. Closing arguments tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Now back to New Hampshire, where we are in day one of the retrial against Timothy Verrill. Prosecutors say that Verrill brutally murdered two women after he became suspicious that one of them was tipping the police about his drug trafficking business. Mm -hmm. Vero initially stood for uh, stood trial for these murders back in October of 2019, but a mistrial was declared after the judge ruled the state failed to hand over evidence to the defense. All right, let's get you back into court. Still in the stand, we have the investigator direct examination again, surveillance video from cameras so they can see what's happening at that house where those mm -hmm. bodies were found. Let's go back into the courtroom. The video file. The first begins at embedded time of 3.46 a.m. on January 25th, and it's going to last about 56 seconds. Once again, there is no sound that accompanies this video, correct? That's correct. 
And we just saw a little skip in the video. Are we going to be seeing a similar skip uh, at various occasions during the playing of videos? At times. And was that a function of the actual video itself and not editing? It's a function of the video itself. And next, we'll play the second clip. And this begins at embedded time of 3.49 a.m. And it lasts about a minute and three seconds. And we, do, do we see some movement in that area, that second area that we talked about, interior area, yes. to the right? That's correct. two clips did we see the two men and the woman that you referred to earlier that's seen in other parts of this clip as well yes sir that, that's them and is each one of those three persons just seen in the video also seen in still photos for this same hour-long footage that comprised states exhibit 30c which you reviewed before yes and are some of those photos from states exhibit c from that other interior camera camera seven they are with that, let's review the seven uh, still photos from State's Exhibit 30C. The first two still photos show a male circled in orange. Do these still photos depict that same male from your viewing of the surveillance video? Yes, they do. The photo on the upper left with an embedded timestamp of 3.18 a.m., that was taken from interior camera seven. Correct. So we'll see this from time to time again in the videos as well. At some time, at some times does the video show in color, and sometimes the video show in black and white? It does. And if you can explain that to the jurors based on what you observed from watching these videos? If uh, there's not sufficient light, um, camera will uh, default to uh, black and white. Moving on to two other still photographs for the same hour-long period, a female circled in purple. Do these still photos depict the same female from your viewing of the surveillance video? They do. And the last still photographs for this hour-long period that encompasses States Exhibit 30C, two males. One is circled in orange, and one is circled in blue. With respect to the male circled in orange, does he appear to be the same male that was seen in the two previous uh, still photographs that we took a look at? He does. And the second male circled in blue, do these still photos depict the same man circled in blue from your viewing of that surveillance footage? Uh, that's true too. And with respect to the male circled in blue, are the top photos seen here the same photos on this next slide, which is States Exhibit 34. This yes, is all the same ones. individual. So returning to the hour-long portion of surveillance video from the file with embedded time of 3 to 4 a.m. on January 25th, towards the end of this portion of video, do the three people seen in the videos and the still photos just seen, the two men and the woman, do all three leave the residence together? Basically. And by what means do the three leave? The uh, heavyset gentleman with the uh, uh, bald shaved head uh, and the beard gets into what appears to be a pickup truck. Um, and the gentleman with the ponytail and the um, 
female get into a station wagon? And those two separate vehicles that they get into, are those the two vehicles that are seen parked at the residence at the very beginning of the video clip? That's correct. And is the three people leaving the residence at about the same time to it in the next two surveillance clips that we're going to be viewing from outside surveillance cameras? It is. So let's begin with exterior camera two, which is highlighted in purple. All right, let's bring in our guest still with us, criminal defense attorney Marie Pereira. Marie, great to see you, as always. Um, I want to talk about my contention that this particular evidence, this video evidence of what's going on at the house, is really important for the state because it stands in contrast to the other evidence that is not so good for the state. For instance, the relationship between Dean Smorok and one of the victims, as well as this idea that he was involved in the murder, right? And the forensic evidence don't necessarily point to our defendant. So when you have those things, I think they're relying a lot on what they see on this video to convince this jury that he had to have been involved. Had to have been involved doesn't mean that he's the one who murdered the victims. They have his fingerprints, right, on disposal bags. So he might have been involved in the cleanup and cover-up, but this evidence doesn't necessarily prove that he did it. And that's what we're here for, to prove that he committed those two murders. And prosecution is not there yet. Like I said earlier, they are driving us down Conviction Boulevard, but Reasonable Doubt Road is still here on the GPS for the jurors because the DNA is undeniable. And his DNA was not on the victims, not under their nails, not in the ceiling, and they don't know whose blood that is. So they could show all the videos they want. They could show airport videos, they could introduce boogeymen, but they are not getting to where they need to get. They need to prove that he committed the murders, not just put his fingerprints on a bag where the bodies were or things belonging to the victims. That is not murder. The DNA problem is still there with all of this other evidence that they're producing. They need to solve that or we're going to rest on reasonable doubt street at the end of the day. Hmm. But I think that all of this surveillance video really helps with a building block so that the state can try to say in spite of the DNA evidence, here's enough other evidence for you to find it reasonable that yeah, he did this and you should convict him. But putting that aside, Let's just talk a little bit about the actual testimony and the prosecutor. I think it's a skillful way, given all the different number of cameras. I said to Michael, oh, it seems like this could be a little boring, but it, it's necessary. It laid the foundation, I thought, very clearly. It helped me understand exactly where the cameras were, what angle they were looking at, and now very clear, two people on these cameras. Now we have the cars entering. I think the prosecution is really getting good testimony from this witness. And they are. And at the end of the day, it is very confusing and it's going to be really hard when the jurors are deliberating to say, okay, who could have done it? Nobody else was there. It's him. We see it. But when they're pressed with making a decision, they're going with the science. And I believe DNA science has better weight in that deliberation room to create reasonable doubt than the videos. It is really like, a, like who done it? But when the jurors are going to be faced with that decision, they are going to look to DNA because DNA is what's undeniable here. If his DNA was not under the woman's fingernails, his DNA was not, there was somebody else there, a third party. And all the DNA they have is on bags, fingerprints, not under the victim. And that's going to prevail over everything else when there's a whodunit situation. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that makes sense, it does, but it doesn't mean that he's not guilty as well. If you can show me videos that show all of them there at the house, then the video goes out and you know at the, around that time, those people end up dead. Yeah, it, they're involved, it, it, an argument, I agree. An argument can be made, yes, somebody else might have been in that house as well, but he, but he could be still guilty. be guilty. Right, he might mm -hmm. be guilty as well. All right, Marie, stand by. We're going to take a break. Now, before we do, um, I want to uh, provide a quick programming note. Starting tomorrow, the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard civil trial will premiere on Court TV Legendary Trials. Details on where to watch the Legendary Trials channel are free, for free, are located on our website. And 
If you're all in on the small town secrets murder trial right here on Court TV, you can catch a Debt Be Heard marathon this Sunday beginning at 8 a.m. only on Legendary Trials. The small town secrets murder trial remains underway in New Hampshire. Defendant Timothy Verrill is facing a jury accused of killing Jenna Pellegrini and Christine Sullivan back in 2017. Some prosecutors say he was a paranoid drug dealer who brutally beat and stabbed the two women before discarding their bodies under the home of Sullivan's friend, Dean Smorunk. But Verrill claims Smorunk is the real killer. On the stand is Steven Johnson. He's an investigator who reviewed the surveillance footage from the scene. So let's get back into court. Portion of video. It's uh, parked in a little spot in the uh, uh, driveway that, that has some additional parking area. Um, and it's just uh, by the corner of the uh, right front corner of the residence. And am I pointing to it with the laser pointer here? Yes, you are. And you said that the heavy set uh, man is the one who walks to this vehicle and drives off? That's correct. So let's play this portion of video. It begins at a bedded time of 3.51 a.m. And this is gonna last about 28 seconds. Let's move on to the last video clip that's going to be played for this hour-long period. It's from exterior camera three, which is highlighted in red. And we see the parked car here in this portion of video. That's correct. And the female who's seen in this portion of video, from your review of the video, it's the same female that was seen inside in the footage before? It is. And the male that's going to be seen in this uh, video is the same male with the ponytail that was seen before? That's correct. So let's play this portion of video. It begins at a bedded time, 3.52 a.m., and it lasts just over a minute. What date and time is indicated in this portion of the video when the male and the female drive off together? Yeah, January 25th, 2017, and it's at uh, 0353 hours or 353 a.m. And returning to State's Exhibit 34, what date and time is indicated uh, by the bottom two surveillance photos from Logan Airport? And the next slide has been uh, enlarged for those time periods. Uh, the same day, January 25th, 2017, and it's at 5.28 a.m. And here we have a time comparison between the two, which is about an hour and a half. About how long time-wise is the drive from Farmington, New Hampshire, to Logan Airport in Boston? Uh, depending on traffic, about an hour and a half. We'll next turn to another hour-long portion of the surveillance video. This is file ending 120 D6. The embedded time for this video begins about 11 hours after the last video ended. So now we're at embedded time 3 to 4 p.m. on January 25th, 2017. 
And we're going to begin with exterior camera two, which is highlighted in purple. Uh, looking at the still photo for this period on the bottom right, uh, shading wise, it looks different from the footage from this same camera that was played earlier from the early morning of January 25th. And a comparison is going to be on the next slide. If you can explain the difference in appearance between the two videos of the same vantage point. It's just the one is taken at daylight, which is the one to the right, and the one on the left is, is at nighttime. And the similar changes in lighting occur in other portions of exterior camera video that we're going to be viewing today and tomorrow? That's correct. You testified that in the last video file just reviewed, there initially were two vehicles parked at the residence. At the beginning of this hour-long portion of video, are there any vehicles at the residence uh, seen on any of the exterior cameras? There are not any. At the beginning of this portion of surveillance video, does a vehicle enter the driveway and park outside the residence? It does. And is that vehicle's arrival depicted in this next video portion that we're going to be playing from exterior camera two? It is. And from about where is that vehicle going to be coming into camera view as we look um, at it? Going to be coming in from uh, the Meadowboro Road uh, on the left side and entering the driveway um, and pulling down to the driveway um, a good halfway at least. So it's going to be coming towards us as we're looking at the video? Coming down from the left side and then entering the driveway and uh, parking in the uh, in the driveway area by that extended area that, that you can see. So now, now let's play this portion of surveillance footage from camera two. It begins at an embedded time of 3.07 p.m. on January 25th. It lasts only about eight seconds. With respect to that arriving vehicle, are still photos of it from different exterior surveillance cameras depicted in this next slide, which is State's Exhibit 30D? Yes. And uh, we have a vehicle that's circled in yellow. Is this the same vehicle? It is. Looking at the timestamps at the bottom, the one on the left, we have 312, and then we have 313. Were these still photos taken when the vehicle arrived at about 3.07 p.m. in the video we just played, or when it later left the residence? It's when they left. It left the residence. So the car left only about five minutes after it arrived? Correct. The photo on the left, that was from exterior camera two, from which we just played the video clip. This photo right here, that's from exterior camera two? Yes. The photo on the right, from what exterior camera is this? That's from camera one. And the videos from which these two stills were taken, they show the car leaving the driveway? That's correct. Returning to the video clip beginning about five minutes earlier, showing that arrival of the vehicle, does anyone leave the car and enter the residence? Yes. A and male. how many people? One. And that one person is he depicted in the next surveillance video clip that we're going to be playing from. You know, pretty compelling evidence, Michael, when you see him walking down the driveway and you yeah. see the different people. I agree with you. If you have any evidence that he was there at the time of the murders, I think that's enough to convict him. And I'll tell you this. The only thing that I think can rival, I'm not sure it rises to the level of, but rival the forensic evidence, it's video Yes, evidence. absolutely. You know I mean? It's powerful stuff. And what's the one thing the jury might say? Hey, can we see it again? The videos. Mm -hmm. Okay, stay with us. We have to take a break. When we come back, of course, we'll go back inside the courtroom in the case against Timothy Verrill. Tonight on Closing Arguments, the mystery of Madeline Soto. The Florida teenager was found dead in the woods, and now her mother's boyfriend is the prime suspect. Court TV teams breaking down all angles of this investigation as this community searches for answers. Plus, reaction to today's big hearing in the murder case against Karen Reed will bring you the latest as the killer or cover-up trial moves closer. Closing arguments tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Today.
Welcome back to Court TV Live. Michael Ayala here with Judge Ashley Wilcott. Back now to New Hampshire, where Timothy Verrill stands accused of stabbing to death Jenna Pellegrini and Christine Sullivan back in 2017. Right now, the jury is hearing from an investigator who revealed, excuse me, reviewed surveillance footage from the crime scene. He's under direct examination by the state. Let's go back in for more. Entering this residence. It is. About where will that person be seen coming from in this video? From the uh, far right side by that trellis area, um, walking down the driveway and then taking the uh, right turn uh, and going into the uh, 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 porch that's down below and entering the uh, property. So now let's play this video. It's time stamped at 3.07 p.m. and it lasts only about seven seconds. The area where the person in the last video was seen walking into is that area covered by interior camera six highlighted in blue. It is. From your viewing of the surveillance video for this data file, is the person seen here in the doorway the same person seen in the two previous exterior videos driving up to the residence and entering the house? It is. So let's play this portion of video. As with the videos just played, the timestamp again is at 3.07 p.m. And this video lasts about nine seconds. The area where the person walked off to, to the right, that again is another interior area that had a surveillance camera? That's correct, that's that den area that's... Uh, um... And that's interior camera seven, highlighted in green? That's correct. From your review of the surveillance video for this time period, is the person who's depicted here, who I'm pointing out with the laser pointer, is that the same person earlier in the video seen entering the house after parking the car and driving up the driveway and parking the car? It is. The timestamp on the bottom shows 3:12 uh, p.m. Does this video clip that we're going to be viewing does this show the person leaving or entering the residence? Just before he leaves. And so let's play that clip. It lasts only about five seconds. From your review of the surveillance, where generally does the person go after leaving camera view from here? He enters into the uh, utility uh, laundry room uh, that's viewed by camera uh, six, and then exits through the uh, doorway, comes out onto the driveway, and gets into the car and leaves. And going back to State's Exhibit 30D, these again are stills of that same man leaving the residence in the car that he had driven up, driven in. With. That's correct. With respect to that single person seen on surveillance video footage entering and leaving the residence during this period, are still photos of him from different cameras depicted in this next slide, which is State's Exhibit 30E. They are. And the next four slides, excuse me, <clears throat> are going to be each one of these photos individually. Was anyone else observed in the house other than this single person during this time period? No one else. The next video file from which we'll play portions of surveillance video is file ending 120 DB. It has an embedded beginning and ending date and time of 8 to 9 p.m. on January 25th of 2017. Now first, reviewing stills from the beginning of this video file, are there any vehicles parked outside the building seen on surveillance camera? There are not. A few minutes into this video file, does a vehicle pull into the driveway and park outside the residence? It does. It's that station wagon that we saw previously. And is that vehicle and where it ultimately parks seen in these two still photos? It is. And how many people are in the car? Two. Uh, when we last saw this car leaving the residence, it was a female and a male. How about now? Two females. 
And what generally do those two females do when they arrive at the residence together in this car? They exit the vehicle and enter the home, uh, sometimes carrying uh, some uh, parcels with them. And is some of that unloading depicted in the first two video clips that we're going to be playing from this file, which are interior cameras uh, seven and six? Correct. And let's move to the first of those interior clips, which is interior camera seven, and that's again highlighted in green. The person whose back is to the camera on the right, uh, generally, who is that? Uh, it's a new individual that we hadn't seen previously. It's a female, uh, slightly taller than the other female with a slightly darker hair. And uh, the female that we're looking at whose back is turned to us, do you recall if she was the driver of the vehicle or the passenger of the vehicle? From what She was the passenger. During this portion of video that we're going to view, does the second female from the car also come into view? Yes, yeah, she'll come out of the uh, doorway that's uh, facing the camera. And am I indicating that doorway with the uh, laser pointer? That'd be correct. Uh, also, during this portion of video, towards the end of the video, is the view of the camera that we're looking at now, is it altered? At the end of it, it is. So now let's play this portion of video. It lasts about 45 seconds. The uh, female that's coming out through the door towards us, is that the driver of the vehicle or is this somebody different? It's the driver. Had earlier surveillance footage camera uh, captured her earlier entry into the house with the other woman? It did. The camera view that we now see obscured on the surveillance footage for interior camera seven, is it gonna be like this going forward in the videos? For most of the uh, rest of the uh, uh, viewing. Let's move on to the second interior camera, which is camera six, which is highlighted in blue. You've called this a utility room and also a laundry room. Why do you call it a laundry room based on your observations of videos? It had um, a washer and dryer uh, in it. And the approximate location of the washer dryer, am I indicating that with the laser pointer? That's correct. Now, in addition to depicting activity in this room, does the footage also uh, that we're going to be playing capture movement in this room off to the right here? It does. From your observation of the surveillance footage, is that activity that will be seen off to the right here, is that from the two females who arrived together by car or somebody else? No, it's by the two females. Is anyone else other than those two females seen in the surveillance footage for this period? No other one is seen during that time period. So now let's play this portion of video footage and it lasts about two minutes. All right, so again, folks, this is two days before when police believe or when prosecutors believe the murders actually right. happened on 27th. This was the 25th. Mm -hmm. Let's bring in our guest, still with us, criminal defense attorney Marie Pedetta. What What is going on here? Why are they showing us all these comings and goings a couple of days before? Again, I, I, in this particular video, it's a woman they hadn't seen before. She's there with another woman. So it's interesting that they're showing us all these comings and goings on these videos. I think they're trying to really show that, you know, what people came and people left, but at the end of the day, he was the only one in the house when the uh, windows were spray painted. He was the only one plausibly in the house when these murders took place because these people came and they left and it was him alone who was in there. That's what they're trying to prove. And Michael, I know you say that the video evidence is almost as compelling as the DNA evidence, but I'm watching and this whole thing is a little bit confusing to me, especially they're showing the videos prior to when it happened. And I feel like if I'm confused, the jurors may be confused too. And I'm still sticking to my DNA. 
If they're saying he did it, then his DNA should be under the uh, fingernails. And his DNA is only according to what they've said on garbage bags that were used to dispose items. His mere presence inside the house does not dispositively show that he is the one who committed the murders. And unless he was charged with improperly disposing of a body, conspiracy to commit, he has to be the one who is the direct cause of the murders. Yeah, fair enough. And, and you know, he is charged with falsifying mm -hmm. evidence, altering, destroying, or hiding that's a, that's evidence. So th at. there are those charges. Okay. So, you know, eventually right. that, that could be what this jury decides on. Uh, again, we have to wait and see, Judge, what else this prosecution has. But, but uh, Marie, let's, let's be clear. I'm not in disagreement with you. I'm just trying to understand why this prosecution was bought. Because if I take you for what you say and you look at it, you're a former prosecutor, you know, without the DNA there, and you just have this video and maybe some other testimony, um, why would they bring this case? Yeah, and you know, I think though the forensics are affected by this, Marie. We know that they were likely asleep in bed. We know that there were multiple stab wounds to both of the victims. Mm -hmm. One of them had more than 40 stab wounds. We also know that Sullivan had an additional injury, a blunt force trauma to the head. Yes. I think that leans into what you may be suggesting, that you would therefore expect to see more of a connection forensically of the defendant to the bodies in the last couple of seconds here. And we all know when there are so many stab wounds, usually the stabber gets wounded too, and there should be some sort of blood connecting him. And we're not finding that. That's my only issue. And to me, I'm hanging on to the DNA. And if the DNA doesn't support the crime scene, no blood from him on their bodies, that could be reasonable doubt. Didn't mean he didn't do it, but whatever he did to keep his DNA from their and bodies. And we're going to have to let you go, Marie. Sorry, bag. thank you for joining us this hour. We'll be back. Court TV Live. Stick around much more. Yep. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. And I'm Judge Ashley Wilcott. Ahead this hour, we are learning that there was once a plea deal on the table for actor Alec Baldwin in his movie shooting trial. Also, the woman accused of killing her Boston police officer boyfriend is back in court for emotions here. And testimony continues in the small town secrets murder trial in New Hampshire. Here are the biggest moments in today's Daily Wrap. I want to focus now specifically on the month of January in 2017, the few weeks leading up to when Christine was killed. Did you interact with the defendant during those weeks? I did. Did you notice a change in his behavior during those weeks? Only on one occasion. Can you describe that occasion for us? Um, he was just outside his car and he just seemed a little agitated, uh, um, a little nervous. And that first occasion when you saw him acting agitated, did he say anything about any particular drug usage at the time? Um, he did. He said that he had been doing DMT. Do you remember if he said he was doing any other drugs? I think Coke. Around, uh, during that interaction as well, did the defendant say anything to you about the types of thoughts he was having? That's in the car when we were driving home. He, he said that he needed to get off of everything because he was having some, some dark thoughts. Is it fair to say that over time you saw Christine less than less? Yes. And part of the reason why you saw her less is because you were uncomfortable with the people she had at the house? Yes. Josh, you saw up there. Mike, Victoria, anybody else that you recall? I mean, Tim was there. Um, Did he make you feel uncomfortable? Never. So with the, you described the relationship between Christine, Christine and Dean as tumultuous. She was showed te uh, described text that Dean sent? Uh, both that she sent to him and he sent to her. And, um, in fact, Dean told you directly that he wanted to kill her. I mean, he's, he's yeah, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to want to, you know, sometimes I want to kill her, that type of thing. And you didn't know whether to take it serious or not? I mean, I, did, I didn't take it serious. I, she, yeah, I didn't. I hoped that wouldn't happen. <laughs> I want to direct your attention to the morning of Sunday, January 29th, 2017. 
That morning, did you respond to 979 Meterboro Road in Farmington? I did. Upon your arrival at the residence, uh, from that point on, were you involved in what turned out to be a homicide investigation regarding uh, two females whose bodies were found on the property? Yes, I was. Had their bodies been found by police when you responded to 979 Meterboro Road that Sunday morning? No. Uh, despite not seeing any bodies, you and other officers summoned the assistance of the New Hampshire State Police and began a, a homicide investigation? That's correct. Was that because of the nature of the blood evidence that you and other officers saw? Yes. Uh, as, as you said on direct, initially Dean did not want you to look at his phone? That's correct. Um, and he told you that uh, he was embarrassed about texts uh, that he had sent to Christine Sullivan? He did. Um, he said he was embarrassed by those because they were verbally abusive? Yes, he did. Uh, Dean told you, uh, he said, so anyway, like he was getting abusive, like verbally abusive, like I was really tearing her down. And so if you, if you take the text threads, I'm embarrassed because I got to the point of like, look, just leave already, go. Then he said, I'm so embarrassed because I, I was like trying to get her to go a longer way and I couldn't make her leave. And so I resorted to some mental abuse, you know? Like I, I was calling her names and telling her she's a and, you know, she didn't know how and she didn't. She, you're a bitch, you're an I called her every name in the book because like, what's gonna make it, what's gonna take to make her leave? Sorry, what is it gonna take to make her not love me so she'll leave, you know? Is that right? Is there a question? Yes, that okay. sounds correct. Now, Timothy Verrill is charged with the murder of two women in 2017. Of course, we've been pausing testimony throughout the day, so you don't miss a moment. Stephen Johnson, an investigator with the New Hampshire Attorney General's Office, is still on the stand direct examination, talking about photos and surveillance video from inside that house. Let's go back to court. And again, did we just see some of that skip that's part of the video itself, not part of any editing? That's correct. Uh, where is that woman going to and returning from when we see her leaving through the doorway and coming back from the doorway? She goes out to the car and picks up packages, brings them in, and puts them inside the uh, residence. And we're seeing some of that movement on to the other room here, right? That's correct. So lastly, for clips for this video file with embedded time from 8 to 9 p.m. on January 25th, we're going to turn to exterior camera 6, which is highlighted in red. The person seen in this portion of video, who is it generally? Generally that uh, new female party that's slightly taller and has slightly darker hair. So let's now play that portion of video, which lasts again about two minutes.
are still photos of those two women contained in States Exhibit 30 F, one circled in green and the other one circled in purple? They are. And were all these still photos taken from the same video file from the videos that we just played? They are. So let's turn to another hour-long video file. It's file name ending 120EO with a beginning and ending embedded time and date of 1 to 2 a.m. on January 26, 2017. Does State's Exhibit 30G depict the sole car that's parked outside the residence at the beginning of this hour-long portion of surveillance video? It does. It's that same station wagon. At the beginning of the video, are any other cars parked at the residence seen in surveillance footage? Other than the station wagon, no. In this video file, do surveillance cameras record a second vehicle driving up to the residence? It does. And will that second vehicle be seen in this next video clip taken from exterior camera 2, which is highlighted in purple? It will. And will that vehicle be again coming towards the direction of Meterboro Road and coming towards us in the video? That's correct. It'll be coming off of Meterboro Road onto the driveway and then up the driveway. So let's play this portion of video. It begins at timestamp 107 a.m. on January 26, and this is going to last about 51 seconds. When the vehicle is driving up the driveway, this light turned on. We'll see that from time to time again. Based on your review of the surveillance footage, does this appear to be a motion detector type light? It does. Uh, about where does that vehicle park in this overhead? Right around the edge of the uh, front part of the, of the home. Um, oh, right here. So very close to where the, the black car is on that picture, in that, in that general range. So let's turn to another exterior camera, exterior camera three, highlighted in red. And the time is about half an hour after the video just played. It's about 1.38 a.m. now. Is the vehicle that had arrived about a half an hour earlier, is it still at the residence at this point in time in the surveillance video footage? Both vehicles are still there, the station wagon as well as the uh, larger vehicle. Had either one of those vehicles left from the time that the uh, vehicle arrived at the residence? They had not. And about where is that vehicle that arrived and parked earlier on this still photo to the right? We can't see it here, right? It's up the driveway, right around uh, the edge of the uh, front edge of the uh, residence, but and, in the driveway. And from your review of the surveillance video, how many people arrived by vehicle at about 1.07 a.m.? Single male. And where did that male go after leaving the vehicle? Inside the uh, residence. In this portion of video, does the male and a female do something outside the house that we'll be watching? They do. They come out and they take an item out of the, out of the station wagon's back. And what do they do with that item that they take out of the station wagon? They bring it into the home. With that context, let's play this portion of video. Uh, embedded time about 1.38 a.m. And this lasts about 52 seconds. From your review of the video, the female that's with him, is she the uh, driver of the vehicle from before or the passenger? She was the driver, the shorter, kind of blonder woman um, that we've seen previously. And again, we're seeing some of that skipping that is part of the video itself, right? That's correct.
Let's continue with this same hour-long period, and we're going to go on to interior camera six, highlighted in blue. The male and the female seen outside in the previous video clip, where are they generally at the beginning of this clip that we're going to be viewing? They come in through the uh, entrance doorway and uh, carry the object in, uh, which appears to be a uh, large clock. So let's play this portion of video. It lasts about 33 seconds, and it's an embedded time about 1.40 a.m. Oh, bringing in a large clock. It's interesting. I'm not sure where this is going, Michael, but we have to take a short break. When we return, the state wraps up its direct examination of this witness. Stay here with us on Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Tonight on Closing Arguments, the mystery of Madeline Soto. The Florida teenager was found dead in the woods, and now her mother's boyfriend is the prime suspect. Court TV teams breaking down all angles of this investigation as this community searches for answers. Plus, reaction to today's big hearing in the murder case against Karen Reed will bring you the latest as the killer or cover-up trial moves closer. Closing Arguments, tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Before we get you back to court, let's bring in National Trial Attorney Michael Jaffer. Michael, always great to have you on with us. Thank you for your time. I mean, this is a case of intrigue, but at the end of the day, we know we have drug users, we have drug sellers, we have the owner of the home then serve time for drug trafficking. These aren't the kind of people that everyone's going to like and say, oh, they're great upstanding citizens. How much does it affect a jury to start with that premise that the defense made very clear, these are drug users, these are drug dealers so you need to know that from the beginning oh absolutely it's going to affect them dramatically because the sympathy factor by the jury is going to go way down when they know that these people are villains right uh and i'm not saying this is right but they will kind of not feel sorry for some of them and they might blame some of them and say you know hey listen you put yourself in this situation you reap what you sow so the answer to your question judge ashley is it's going to affect the jurors in my opinion deeply uh and not it, it, not against the defendant necessarily. It's, I mean, it might they might point the finger some and somewhat uh, to to the victims. I don't think they should, but I think it's going to definitely have a dramatic impact. You know, Mike, the, the 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 murders in this case were very brutal. I mean, there were over 40 stab wounds on one. That person was stabbed while they were sleeping. Uh, there was a, a, a what do they call that? Blunt force trauma to the head of another. I mean, these are brutal murders, right? And what we have here, what this jury is going to hear, that there was a lot of anger between this Dean Smorrow character and his girlfriend, Christine, one of the victims. But we're also going to hear that the defendant thought that these guys, or at least one of them, were informing on them to the police regarding this drug uh, enterprise that they had going on. But not with the same amount of vitriol that I see in the murder. So I wonder, normally it's a positive for the state when they have really brutal murders. Here it might be a negative. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. It's going to be a big negative because at the end of the day, the, you know, the, 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 like the victims here in this case brought themselves into a situation where they were around these characters and these characters really are just very bizarre and very dark and the whole entire thing, the drug use, uh, the text messages, the nature of the crime, the heinousness of the crime. I mean, to stab somebody 40 times, right? Just imagine seeing that on video. Just imagine if you're investigating the crime, right? I mean, what is left of that person's corpse at that point stabbed 40 times it's really 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 bad so um i think this whole thing is uh, becoming grotesque uh, and the jury are in the courtroom witnessing it and we haven't even gotten to the defense's case i'm really interested to see what their case is going to be i mean we kind of have we have a, a kind of hindsight uh foresight into what they're going to do but uh this is looking really really grotesque and, you know, Michael, whoever did it took time to then, as you know, wrap the bodies in a tarp mm -hmm. and put them underneath the stairs in the home. So they took some additional time to do that. Yeah, but we do know, and here's the part that complicates things, we do know that the DNA of the defendant was found on bags mm -hmm. where DNA of the victims were found. Yeah. So we know he had something to do with it, and that's what makes it difficult. Yeah, it does make it difficult. All right, let's get back into court now, though, for the final direct testimony from an investigator with the New Hampshire Attorney General's office.
In this same video file, shortly after the man helps the woman bring that clock into the house, does he leave and drive off in the same vehicle that he had arrived in earlier in the video? He does. Let's continue with another video file. This one file ending 120 EF with a beginning and an ending embedded time and date of 4 to 5 p.m. on January 26, 2017. So again, we've moved ahead several hours from the last video file. Correct. Looking at States Exhibit 30H, is this a still photo taken at the beginning of that video file? It is. This next slide, is it the same still along with a still photo from the video just played from about 1.38 a.m. that morning embedded time? It is. And the next slide is going to overlap these two photos. Does the car appear to have moved in the roughly 15 hours between those two surveillance stills? It does not appear to have moved. At one point, does the vehicle leave the residence in this video file from embedded time 4 to 5 p.m. on January 26th? It does. And who generally leaves in that car? Initially, the shorter, blonder uh, woman gets in the car, backs it out, starts down the driveway, stops, then gets out of the car, the station wagon, walks back into the home. Um, Eventually, she returns to the car, gets in the driver's seat again, and then a short time later, the other female comes out of the home, gets into the car as well, and then they leave. The five photos on this next slide are parts of State's Exhibit 30I, which you've reviewed before. Uh, before. Uh, is that, do these pictures generally depict the process that you talked about, the two women ultimately leaving and driving off together? That's correct. Uh, in the previous photo, a car was parked by the side of the residence off to the left. Is that same car seen here, indicated by the red arrow? It is. It's that same station wagon we've seen on numerous other photos and videos. And is anyone other than these two females observed in the surveillance footage for this period? No one else. And this will probably be the last file that we, we, we will review for today. It's file ending 120 F5 beginning and ending embedded time and date of 10 to 11 p.m. on January 26. At the beginning of this portion of surveillance video, are there any parked vehicles observed at the residence? No. Towards the end of the video, does a vehicle enter the driveway and park at the residence? Yes. Is the location where the par car parked depicted in State's Exhibit 30J, this photo that we're looking at now? It is. It's that station wagon. And the embedded time here is uh, about 10.59, I believe. Who generally exits the parked car and where do they go? It's the same two females, uh, the driver being the same individual and the passenger being the same individual. They go into the um, residence and then uh, come back out and grab additional parcels that are in the, in the uh, station wagon. And is that activity going to be depicted in the last video clips that we'll be viewing today, uh, both from interior camera six, which is highlighted in blue? That's correct. Let's turn to the first video clip. It lasts about 20 seconds. The embedded start time is 1048 p.m. on January 22nd. Turning to the second clip from that same camera, it's about a minute later, and this clip will last about 21 seconds.
At the very end of this video file, at about embedded time of 11 p.m. on January 26, does a second vehicle enter the driveway? It does. And Judge, I think this might be a good time to break. All right. <clears throat> so, ladies and gentlemen, we will be in recess until tomorrow morning. Just remind you that if you see any uh, media coverage of the case, to turn your attention away. To well, so as you heard there, that pretty much wrapped up uh, the day out there for the prosecution. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more to go with this guy. Oh, He's yeah. working his way up uh, with these video files from uh, the day, two days before the murder. He was on the 26th, getting to about 10.59 on the 26th. We know the 27th is when the murders happen. That's right, and two days later is when the homeowner came back. Mm -hmm. I think until he gets through all his testimony, we really don't know exactly the relevance of some of these videos yes. from before the murders. Exactly. There could be a lot of reasons he's showing the comings and goings. We're not 100% certain yet, but that'll be for tomorrow.